Welcome to the Silmarillion Sessions. I'm Mikhail Thompson, Doctor of Psychology and Professor of English Philology. And with me is Mr. William Lassiter, Master of English Letters and Teacher of Literature for, was it 20 some, 30, no, going on yeah, 20, many 25, years, 25, 25 years, a quarter of a century's worth of teaching experience. Yeah, that's crazy. And we are going to be discussing the Silmarillion over the next series of, of these, the beginning of the series is the, the first, the initial, the, the prime uh, episode where we are going to be delving into the Silmarillion, Tolkien's magnificent work at uh, the beginning and early ages of Middle Earth. The, the, today we're going to be introducing the Silmarillion, talking about what it is, why we should read it, and um, and, and, and give some general sense of the layout of, of where we're going with it, where Tolkien, in fact, goes with it, and where we can go together. Sounds good. All right, uh, maybe, yeah. William, why don't you, you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, what is your, your background with uh, Tolkien, with literature? Why are we talking about this? Why did we decide to come up with this particular um, work or set of works, as we'll see, uh, to discuss? today and in the future. Thank you, Cameron. Well, you, as people watching probably know, we did a session on The Hobbit earlier and that went swimmingly and it was a great deal of fun. And uh, in some ways we do this uh, to keep our own sanity and also to keep in touch with the works of J.R.R. Tolkien because he's such a fantastic writer of all the writers of the 20th century. I think he's probably one of the great writers of hope in the 20th century. Why do we choose the Silmarillion? You know, why do we choose that? I think one of the reasons we chose this um, was because of all Tolkien's works. It's sort of setting the groundwork for what comes later with The Hobbit and, and The Lord of the Rings. Um, it's it's epic in its proportions. It has a wonderful insight into human nature and also to the secondary worlds that Tolkien creates. And to be quite honest, it's, I think, um, easier to tackle to some degree than the magnificent trilogy that I want to get to eventually. And I know you've expressed that too. So um, when we were considering what next to talk about, um, Moby Dick by Herman Melville was on the table for a minute or two. And we decided that was just a little too big that, you know, that, that hump like a white whale was just a little too large to tackle. So, and, and also a little too depressing. So yeah, I, that goes into some really so, dark space. Yes, it does. And so I thought, well, you know, let's not go there. Let's go to something that we actually enjoy that is uh, happy and joyful um, and has this um, messages for the 20th century. So let's do the Silmarillion. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's do that. All right. Good. Well, I'm certainly excited to do it. I think it's it's very timely um, and and provides us an opportunity to as you said, you know, this really establishes that foundation because one of the things as I've read through Lord of the Rings, uh, as we do, we do as a family, we read through Lord of the Rings pretty much on a continuous cycle, uh, that and the Hobbit, uh, is, and, and working in the Silmarillion every once in a while of these relevant portions uh, based on the age of the children, the, the there's a lot that is very easy to just simply not notice in the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit for that matter, uh, that the that 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 is a direct reference to the Silmarillion, the, the events in the Silmarillion, the themes, the patterns that are set up, that really the Silmarillion I've found to be key to not only understanding Tolkien's thought and has it is immense value in itself, but really to understanding the, 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 the gravitas, the immensity, the power of so many aspects, so many different elements and, and events in the rest of the legendarium, especially throughout the, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, the so much is drawn in, and, and way before even the rings are created. I mean, there's a lot that frames up who are the Numenorians? Where is, why is Gondor there? How did the hobbits come about? What's the background of the elves? And their personal backstories makes what we see in the Lord of the Rings just that much more profoundly yes. moving. Yes. When we can see where that's all coming from in the background. I concur, definitely. I mean, Tolkien has such a fertile imagination and really, I mean, when we're looking at any work of art, we are definitely looking at what the art itself means and what it says to us, uh, apart from the artist to some degree. 
But I think with some artists, it's also fascinating to look at the art as an expression of what they're thinking about and what they have to say about the world. You know, you look at Michelangelo's mm -hmm. works and they're beautiful, magnificent in and of themselves. But they also tell us something about him and his worldview and who he was and what he struggled with. So I really think that as, you know, as an introduction to certain works, sure, you could just talk about the plot and the setting. But as you go deeper, it's like you really want to kind of know what was this guy thinking? What, where did this come from? And this work, yeah. especially Tolkien, he molded this over and worked this over for years. My understanding is it wasn't published during his lifetime. It was a posthumous publication in, I think, 77. Uh, right. I was, a, I was a wee tot myself at the time. Yeah, yeah uh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, and I was going to say, the, um, the, it's composed, it's not, I mean, it's not a single work, but the what we have, there are multiple ed, uh, versions as Tolkien himself worked through different um, ed 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 editions in the sense of reworking manuscripts. He has some initial thoughts. He reworks them, rewrites them. And so we have this tome, or at least his son, who was the late Christopher Tolkien, who was working, 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 and collecting these and editing these and trying to weave them together into a single work or a single set of works. Is that Tolkien, as a single man, has almost as many different manuscript traditions as entire civilizations do. Yes, when it comes to their myth, mythologies and stories. Yes, yes, and uh, like you said, uh, he has he has worked it for years. I think he started it even when he was a boy. There are elements of of this you see in yeah, his notes, right. his school notes as a grammar school student. So yeah. it was in his mind for years, and he considered it his greatest work too. I think that was. His proclamation of it was, or judgment of it was, it was his greatest work. This is so what, one of the things that I find fascinating about Tolkien, and one of the reasons I think it's important to read through this work, uh, to, Tolkien is, his, his mind is so rich, and he spent so much time working through his mythologies and getting it right, and meticulously making sure everything fit and backstories. He really seemed to have seen himself as a reconstitutor of earlier myths, of bringing earlier yeah. stories of the West into a modern setting of the 20th century, which is a very, very important role to play. And I got to admit, one of the things that led me to want to read the Silmarillion <laughs> is actually my natural tendency to gripe about things. Because there was a recent production that came out, a live production, you know, a live action production uh, mm -hmm. of some elements taken loosely out of context from the Silmarillion. And uh, right. we won't mention which one that is, but it is done by Amazon and, oh, heck, it's called the Rings of Power. So what the heck, you know, let's just cut to the chase. Right. Um, <laughs> and a lot of the critique of that by people all over the internet was that when they did that series, they didn't seem to bother to delve into any of the lore, any of the mythology, right. really. And a lot of the writing and a lot of the character interpretation was so shallow compared to what Tolkien mm -hmm. actually created that right. that hardcore lovers of Tolkien were incensed because it seemed to draw off interest from Tolkien rather than driving the interest towards Tolkien's works. Um, so if, yeah. for instance, you know, if it was that bad, why not go back to the Silmarillion and see what, what the real stuff was and how good it really was? Exactly right. What actually is in the Silmarillion? What actually is the Silmarillion? What are things? What are the things that are going on in the early ages of, yeah. of Middle Earth? And I think that that raises the point. We should just dive in right away. Is what is the Silmarillion? Yeah. What are we talking about? Is the thing before we even get into the content? What is it? Because you know, as I mentioned, there's the different stories within the Silmarillion, each of which themselves, so like the backstory of Galadriel, for example, yeah. which plays actually a very, very small part of the Silmarillion. Galadriel as a character, though, has multiple different manuscript traditions about who she is, how she meets Celeborn, how, what their history is. There's different versions of that that Tolkien himself was working through, uh, much like you might see in a real history scene from, told from different perspectives. Um, but the, the Silmarillion in its, what we'll call the final product, the received you know, um, complete manuscript, yes. the received tradition, is is actually a number of different works collected together mm -hmm. uh, in much the same way, or at least in a similar way as the Torah is multiple books, five different books treated as a whole, oh. right? So the old, or just the entirety of Old Testament literature, right? You've got, you know, the 
the, the various histories in the prophets, you know, you see in the Old Testament, it's, it's a number of different books, right? It's, you know, how we count them and how we call them varies on our different uh, traditions and backgrounds. But you can take the first five books of the Bible are five distinct books, right? Each with their own particular manuscript traditions, all of that kind of studies. But the basic thing is that they're not five chapters of a book, right? They're five different books that are treated as a collective work. And the Silmarillion is is in, is um, the same in that way. Yeah. In that we've got the Silmarillion, properly speaking, which is the story of the Silmarils and the backstory of just about everything else that flows that that's you know, the backstory of everything else that follows in Middle Earth. But that itself is preceded by the Ainu Lindale, which is the cosmogonic myth, the creation myth. Yeah of middle earth how did it come how did reality come into being how did the created order come about and that is a beautiful story uh very mythic in its in its uh, almost poetic in its nature though it's written in prose um this is something that we're going to be delving into in the, in the subsequent ep uh, next next one or two episodes but that's there the creation myth and then there's the valaquenta which essentially reads for those of you who've who've seen it who've gone through it it you might think well it, that's kind of dry you know it reads essentially like a catalog of the gods what are the valar what are what are the valar who are they what are the maya how do the wizards fit in helpful but hard to on like really get a sense of what it is but that when we dive into that we'll see that it's actually quite rich with meaning with significance and we'll be able to draw on that to tie in to how those individual beings, the Valar and the Maya, actually develop throughout the stories. Uh, but the Silmarillion itself is primarily about the elves, which raises a question that we should discuss at some point. We probably won't get to it today, is what exactly are elves? What are dwarves, uh, etc.? All these different creatures, not just the Maya and the Valar that are sort of unique to Tolkien, but what are their, um, their, their equivalents? in other stories of, of our world that we that we know uh, you know why write these elves and dwarves we know about these from other fairy stories why write these into the history of of our world why write these into the silmarillion um, but the race of men in the silmarillion actually comes in slowly but surely and we see a transition throughout the silmarillion from a story of elves to a story of men uh, human beings right uh, they, and they feature increasingly in the latter part. So we see the rise and sort of not really diminishing, but the a shift of focus, the rise of the elves in the, as, a, as a race, as a series of different civilizations and kingdoms over thousands of years, and the introduction of men and how the focus comes to focus on, on the race of man, uh, on the human race, and really culminating in the, the great the rise and the great collapse of the technocratic and demon worshiping civilization of Numenor. And that's really what sets up the transition from one land to what we tend to think of as Middle Earth. Uh, now, it's it's important to remember, I think, in all of this, that the fundamental premise for Tolkien, and I guess you, as you mentioned, uh, William, was that uh, you know he's, he's resurrecting a sense of myth. He's trying to weave together myths in a new way, representing myth to the modern world. And that his framing premise for all the whole work of the Legendarium is that the whole of the Middle Earth, the whole of the Middle Earth Legendarium, is meant to be read as a possible, as a plausible prehistory of our own world, right? It's meant to be understood as a long time ago, but emphatically not in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> you know, so, and I think that should cue us in on how and why we should read the Silmarillion and what value it has for us as a mythos to guide us in the world today. Yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, let me just touch on that last thing. What do you make of that? Mm -hmm. Because I, I've read that before and heard other people talk about this before. The Tolkien seemed to have either really believed or was just emphatic in his assertion that he was kind of creating a free history to our history. Um, mm -hmm. The more that I delve, for instance, into um, prehistorical pre uh, civilizations, you know, Katal Hayek, for instance, you know. Right. Um, these other Stone Age civilizations, the more that I realized there was this vast 
world of thought and art and creation, which just got lost, destroyed, deluged, who knows what. Um, right. And... I mean, maybe it wasn't elves and dwarves and all this, but but uh, there does seem to be something about what Tolkien's saying is that um, our, our our world as we currently see it is only a small second in the world clock, so to speak, a fraction mm-hmm. of a small second in the world clock. So what right. we call history, really dating back to even the Greeks or the the Egyptians, is only a few thousand years. What do you do with all that time before? Right, it's really just the last couple of minutes, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's uh, kind of startling, kind of startling. Yeah, and I think that I think it's really fascinating because there's no particular reason to believe that the human civilization isn't much older than what we have, you know, from the 18th, from the 19th century onward, you know, written record of, you know, this this great the invention of modern archaeology and all of that and, and historicism that we're going to find out what the real story was and we've got records that go back to a certain point. Okay, well, this was the first civilization. Logically speaking, there's no reason why there couldn't have been earlier ones that that we just have lost all record of. There's, there's, it's, it was obliterated for one reason or another. Um, and the way that Tolkien sets up the whole of Middle-earth, and it's not just the Silmarillion is a potential past history for us, but that, you know, within the the frame you know for his whole legendariums the idea that well bilbo and aragorn and all of them that like actually was a thing uh in our own history just hundreds of thousands of years ago right right like the whole of it and the continents change you know and in fact as we'll see in the silmarillion you have continental shift you've got the gods warring at some point as we see in many different uh, in the midst of many different civilizations, at, at some point the gods were warring in some prehistoric era. That ship that moved continents fell underwater. Others blew up. Things moved around. There's great land shifts, land mass shifts that happen, and we know, of course, from geological record that such things have happened. Yeah. And Tolkien is simply positing: Why couldn't there have been a civilization prior to the last continental shift, for example? Right. Right, and this is yeah, absolutely right, and and this is something else too in in that same vein of thinking. Um, it, it's very hard for moderns, myself included. I don't know about, I can't speak for you. Very hard for moderns to think in a non-modern mindset. Yeah. You know, how how did people prior even to the 1600s conceive of themselves in the long span of human history? Uh, the oh people that lived, the people that lived in Rome, or the people that lived in ancient Greece or in ancient Egypt, they didn't tell these cosmogonical stories as though they were some academic subject. They didn't talk about them as like, you know, well, what are the actual origins of ourself scientifically? You know, they didn't do that. They didn't have a problem, a dichotomy between, say, the Book of Genesis creation and the actual Big Bang theory in science. They just didn't have these. Things. Right. So for them, for their mindset, everything they did was was placed already in a, a cosmos that involved the war between, you know, Ganesh and the other gods or whatever it was, you know, or, or between Tiamat right. and Marduk. Mm-hmm. They already thought of this as a part of that. And yeah, Tolkien, exactly. is, in some ways, he's creating he's creating a world, sure, but he's also kind of recognizing that our modern mindset just doesn't think that way. We don't ha- we don't have a place to place ourselves anymore uh, in mm-hmm. terms of where where we are. There's a really interesting book um, done by Joseph Campbell actually, which is about the impact of uh, of um, scientific discovery and particularly cosmos, you know, um, study mm-hmm. of astronomy, the impact it has psychologically. And in there, he points out that as we expand our mind to think about the stars, we also expand our mind to think about the stars as big balls of gas. And that changes how we think about the things right in front of us. Exactly. It changes our self-concept entirely. Yeah. So much so that it's very hard to even think outside of that box. It's really kind of startling. Uh, so, like, when we're talking about why do you read the Silmarillion, why do you read any great work, I, I, I hypothesize that any great work is actually in a, there to to crack open your skull, you know, mm-hmm. to split open your worldview, so that maybe there's something more to the world. 
you know, there's that great poem, yeah. of the, uh, the Red Wheelbarrow, right? Which everybody likes as, oh, what a piece of junk. But William Carlos Williams really knew what he was doing when he said, so much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rainwater beside the white chickens. Yeah. That short little poem is saying that red wheelbarrow, which represents poetry and art, is glazed with rainwater. It's reborn. It's made anew. And it's, it splits your concept of this mundane uh, poop-hauling poop device to see it new and sparkling and somehow standing out in stark contrast to the world around it, surrounded by these little white angels in, in the scene that he creates. That's what art does. You know, the, the Silmarillion is it's cracking the worldview of somebody who thinks, oh, there's nothing but World War One. There's nothing but tanks and science and, and, and math. Mm -hmm. you know? so, right. And I think that's one of the things that Tolkien, uh, you know, mentions in a, in a letter that's actually included in some published editions of the uh, of the Silmarillion. And he says that the you know his work as a whole, you know, over the the whole legendarium, um, but I think in, a, in in different ways in the Lord of the Rings and in in the Silmarillion is about uh, the fall, mortality, hmm. and the machine, and and one of the things that characterizes our our modern society in a in a very accentuated way is the machine and machine thinking in a machine society. Um, which is is very much akin to to magic, as we'll see. Those connections get made get made yes. more explicit uh, later on. But but that um, that sense that we live in a world that is you know say characterized by the machine, and by world I mean the modern society, our modern social imaginary that shapes the way we think about contemporary existence, shapes the way yep. we think about ourselves. Yep. Um, and entering into a, a myth, a story like this or any great work of literature like you said is a way to yeah to to like you said crack open our heads to begin yes. to see in a different come crawl out of the shell that we're in to be to see an expanded universe to see the world in a in a different way i mean it's as though if we feel like unrooted trees in modern society like so many people feel this this sense of being unrooted uh, entering into great any great literature, but in a particular way, this, you know, this is one of Tolkien's great great projects, is to provide an avenue for us to reroot into by by entering into this kind of literature, we can find a new sense of rootedness uh -huh. in a world that's much bigger than the merely mechanical, material, um, particulate existence that we think we live in now. That's interesting. You should, you should use that metaphor of uprooted. I, I think that most people feel uprooted, but Tolkien had such a deep love of trees. And I was reminded of this great passage that I read the other day in, in the daily readings. And um, this is uh, from Mark 8. And the passage, yeah, read the daily readings of the Bible. It's a very important thing, but it's sometimes the translations are, are, are bad. And uh, this is just atrocious. This, you know the one I'm talking about, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure. Anyway, oh, yes. The, the reading that I had was something like, you know, he cures a blind man. This is in uh, Mark 8, 24. He cures a blind man. And the blind man says, he looked up and he said, I see men who are walking and are like tr trees or something like that. He it split, split the two um, images. Mm -hmm. In the King James Version, is, I see men like trees walking. And, and that's that's such a powerful image because what what that that blind man when he's first cured is actually seeing a um a spiritual vision he's not he hasn't got his full sight back yet because jesus actually cures him a second time the first time he sees almost a prophetic vision and it's the vision of uprooted trees walking around yeah. the world and we think they're men but they're uprooted trees that's such a great image uh if, if, for instance, the modern world has done anything, it has uprooted people from where they're supposed to be in the forest, uh, the, for, the, the, the forest of the, of the cosmos or whatever. And so we, we, we find people walking around all the time, uh, not knowing where they're going and not knowing when they're supposed to do all this stiff, almost zombie walking. But at the same time, we also find them imprisoned, imprisoned mm -hmm. in a sort of shell of their own had the, the, the mind-forged manacles that William Blake talks about in this right. book. We find people thinking that this is the only way to think. This is how it's always been. The tyranny of the now. You know, uh, what the um, Burke, James Burke calls in the, in the um, 
the, the book Connections, it calls it t- technology trap, the technology mm-hmm. trap, which I think is very accurate. And unless we find a way out of that that technology trap, we we end up being imprisoned, you know, uh, caught in that trap and and unable to to get out. Um, not to mix my metaphors of trees walking and prisoners mm-hmm. in prison, but you know, there it is. So. Well, that prisoners in prison thing is very interesting because that you know one of the things that Tolkien is or fantasy itself is accused of is escapism. And that's something Tolkien addressed in oh, yeah. his essay on fairy stories. What what in what way does something like the Silmarillion, um, you know, how is it a message for hope if we're not just uprooted trees walking around, but also prisoners where we feel as though we're prisoners in some way or another, the experience of being imprisoned. What role does something like the Silmarillion have in being a message of hope or, or what is this idea of escapism? How does Tolkien address that? Well, that's a great question. And to uh, address that, if you don't mind, can I, can I share just the title of this uh, thing through the, the share yeah. video? Thing? Yeah. I, sh- I sent you this article and I thought it was a great mm-hmm. article. This is um, this is by Edward A.W. Stengel and it's called Hope Beyond the Walls of the World, Token on Escapism and New Catastrophe. And it's in the magazine, the online magazine Transpositions. But Stengel points out that one of the elements that we're looking at here is um, sort of rediscovery of joy that allows us to escape. And I'm going to just share the last paragraph here. Um, It says, Tolkien famously denied allegory in any of his writings, but his worldview permeated all he wrote, just as it does for any writer who is honest with himself or herself. His conditions for healthy escapism not abandoning one's life, improving one's own outlook on the world, and being pointed to the ultimate good reality, bring clarity to his worldview. Tolkien wrote with unwavering faith in the truth he saw in reality, that there is hope beyond the walls of the world. That's Tolkien's own words there, hope beyond the walls of the world. He did not seek to teach readers this fact, but instead used his writings to allow them to discover it for themselves. And Tolkien wrote the following, and this I love this quotation. The resurrection of Jesus Christ was the greatest eucatastrophe possible in the greatest fairy story and produces that essential emotion. Christian joy, which produces tears because it is qualitatively so like sorrow, because it comes from those places where joy and sorrow are at one, reconciled as selfishness and altruism are lost in love. I really like that quotation both from from, uh, Tolkien on the one hand and also from Stengel because um, Stengel's point about how this form of hope allows allows us to escape that prison house, that's, that's a very important point. But how does it do it? I think it does it by uh, instilling joy but also allowing us to combat or understand or give language to the sorrow that is inevitably going to happen in the modern world, both things. Uh, and in, in some ways, those two elements act, I think, like a wedge to, again, split open the stony head or the stony soul, if you will, you know, to give uh, hearts of, of flesh rather than hearts of stone. And it's very much like, I'll just finish with this, very much like joy and sorrow are like the old concept from Jewish faith of yesh and ayin. Ayin is nothingness and yesh is something, it's existence. And they are the first manifestations of the divine being in Jewish Kabbalistic thought, the ayin saw for the infinite light of the divine. He manifests himself first as light in yesh against the darkness, the emptiness, or the void, as we call it in Genesis, of, of Ayin. And those two things, the sorrow of the Ayin and the joy of the Yesh, act as a wedge to break open our own prison house of soul or heart so that we begin to see the world uh, in, in as glazed with rainwater, you know, as, as something new. Mm. So, I, so I, that, think I think that's what he's touching on here. So, yeah, good. That's beautiful. So that's then... That speaks to the, the, the nature then of the, 
the 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 artist, the author, the author as artist, as creator, as um, actually this is a thought just occurs, but it, as as artist as creator is is kind of a a guide, a discoverer, or at least somebody who can accompany us along the way of discovery. I think this was indicated in that paragraph, right? He allows us, he's not there as a didactic teacher, but he, his literature accompanies us to discover this for ourselves, discover something more. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and actually in my saying that, I realized stumble over this uh, old English notion, this old Anglo-Saxon notion of, of the storyteller is uh, the shop. Right, a shop, a shaper, right? Essentially, is what we, but this means the same thing as the Greek word poetas, you know, is, is a maker, right? Is the closest thing, um, you know, as, as you well know. And and the idea that a poet is a maker uh, is this this shop is the, the the old English word for it. And this same concept is applied in Christian Anglo-Saxon civilization to uh, to God. To yeah. God as the shop of the world, He's the maker of the world, and so that there's this there's this resonance then between the two, between God's act of creation and the storyteller's telling of a story, the either the creation of a story or the reshaping of a story um, in a new way. Somehow those two are connected in some mystical way. The one is participating in the other. Yeah, they're absolutely connected. And I think that's where Tolkien talks about. Go ahead. Yeah. They're absolutely connected. The um, on the one hand, the artist is discovering the, the the realities of truths as as he or she goes along. I mean, there's that there's a, a famous quotation from Tolkien. Let's see if I can grab it here real quick. Oh uh, yeah, he says, um, "I met a lot of things on the way that astonished me as I was writing this work of the Lord of the Rings." I had never mm. been to the town of Bree, seeing the character Strider sitting in the corner at the inn was a shock, and I had no more idea who he was than had Frodo. I was as mystified as Frodo at Gandalf's failure to appear on September 22nd. Um, yeah. And elsewhere, he has, there's a great poem that he wrote, which is Upon the Hearth, the Fire is Red. I think that, is that Bilbo's poem? I forget whether it's Bilbo or, or, or yeah. Frodo. But anyway, yeah, it's Bilbo. The, opening, the opening section of it, you know, Upon the Hearth, the Fire is Red, Beneath the Roof, There is a Bed, but not yet weary are our feet. Still round the corner we may meet a sudden tree or standing stone that none have seen but we alone. Yes, it's, it's the walking it's, song. It's yeah. a wonderful walking song. It's that, that sense of like you're on this path and you turn a corner and suddenly there's a stone, this magnificent stone there in the rising sunlight covered in moss and lichen with copper running through it. And you're like, I've never seen that. No one's ever seen that. That's a beautiful thing. And and story creation is kind of like that. It's like discovering things that are already there. But right. simultaneously, I think, it is also a creation of, um, of hope and existence in the making of it as well. Now, uh, Michelangelo was famous for when he, the story, you, you know the story behind the creation of the statue, David, right? About how mm -hmm. it was junk. Um, for those of yeah, chunk piece of stone. It was a junk piece of stone, and the, the the people that had worked with it before said you cannot work with the stone, and so they were throwing it away basically. And Michelangelo got it for a song and a dance, and anyway, he goes and takes it back to his studio, and he begins, as he said, to discover the the form of David in the stone. Mm -hmm. Now, he, it wasn't that he wasn't he wasn't just standing there like a Jedi, you know, just waiting for the stone to melt. <laughs> He was chiseling away at it and, and hammering away at it, and um, a lot of sweat, a lot of a lot of work. But he was forming it at the same time that he was discovering it. I, I think that's an amazing thing that a real artist does. They both yeah, form it's a two way activity. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, it is. Um, and that's we'll get into this later, but that's why when we get into the Ina Lindale. That that is the song of the gods who are both singing and discovering at the same time too. Right, they're discovering, and their song is in fact a creation. Uh, uh, and so yeah. that's that notion of what we're talking called. You know, we not we have the I think a beautiful example of it in the Aino Lindale that we'll we will expand more upon uh, in our next episode. But that's something that Tolkien, in other places, writes about as the artistic process, the creative process, is this notion of sub-creation, creating yep, a right. secondary world. Yep. What 
you know, this, this in the creation of you're discovering something and it seems to indicate he, you know, he'll, he'll go so far as to say in some places that, you know, you're discovering something of the divine, as you, as you were just saying, where you, the, the, the author, and this is a common experience of, of many, many authors in writing a story, writing a novel, is that they're discovering some new things as they write. Uh, you know, how many authors have said, well, they wanted to say this or that, but uh, the, the character just wouldn't do it. Yes. You know, and so they had to write differently. Like these, they're actual people that are collaborating. These sub in this sub world, so they're kind of like a, a mini god creating in a sub world. And, and I think there's a lot that could be unpacked to that theme in and of itself. And maybe that's something that fits really well when we talk about the Ainu Lindale. But I want to talk. I want to. I want to talk about the context like why so that if that's the experience right so it's, let's say sub creation is a thing we can unpack it itself in the next episode but why is why is this so important uh, especially for tolkien like when is tolkien tolkien's writing this you know before during and after the world wars right right so he has this experience of the world wars he's living in that time and he's seen terrible terrible things i mean you know the other other people who have seen the trench warfare of world war one don't write the same kind of stuff that tolkien's writing right i mean it's very it's a very different flavor very different world view very different perspective why did tolkien see the need to recreate this world to, to participate in this sort of sub-creation what is he doing when he's doing this that's a really interesting question because, you know, why this work at this time in this place? I thought about that with the great works, you know, like Homer or Dante or the Bible. Why were they created at that time in that place? Um, it's not like the 19th century didn't have its horrors, but they were pretty localized in terms of uh, the battlefield mm -hmm. or um, the diseases that broke out in certain places. Most people didn't get a sort of looming sense of dread of... Uh, you know, this, this ennui that the French right. talk about. Well, we, didn't, yeah, we didn't talk about any of those. Even the, the huge revolutions, the widespread revolution oh. of 1848, weren't talked about as like a world event. They were just a series of localized events. Yeah, Maybe a coordinated it. movement. But we only start talking about world wars in the 20th century. There's this concept that they're global, that they're universal. Yeah. And it's not to mitigate the fact that there was suffering like in the American Revolution, you know, the sense Absolutely. of suffering was occurring or the uh, Civil War in America. It, it certainly was, and people were affected by it. But it, you don't get a real sense of this intense dread universal. And what you do get in the yeah. 19th century in America, I find this interesting. You do get a, most of the authors of the 19th century said, sensed that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And you get some authors like Mary, Mary Shelley on the continent who senses something's wrong, you know. And, yeah. Uh, Hawthorne and, and others, uh, Edgar Allan Poe. Certainly, something's wrong. There's a sense of <laughs> something's very wrong. <laughs> but it wasn't. It, it wasn't this catas. Maybe because it hadn't really come to a full head as it does in World War One, and then the interim years, and then the catastrophes of communism in World War Two. Maybe it hadn't right. come to that level yet. And certainly, the dropping of the A bomb was was a spectacular mm -hmm. example of horror and awfulness. Yeah. So. Most of the authors that are writing about this sense are writing in the negative. That is, you look at Ambrose Bierce, who saw action in the Civil War, and he writes these great stories, but they're so damn depressing. You know, the occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, you know, or the what I saw at Shiloh, they're horrifying. They're just, oh, I mean, they're, they're great. Not the sort of thing you want to read over and over again as you go to sleep, you know. Right. From a Melville, but even right. even the the trench, even the other folks in, in World War One, the trench. What do you call it? The trench poet. These poets, yeah, the, the yeah, poetry. Yeah. This common man's poetry, written by the men in the trenches. Mm -hmm. They're just. It's real. It's, yeah. it's God. See, it's it's visceral. You, you but look it's, at. Um, you look at Siegfried Sassoon. Sassoon was a great poet, and he he has some really vivid imagery. Um, and so did his friend Wilfred Owen, you know, with uh, Dolce at Decorum Est. Right. They're really good poems. Yeah. But that image of in Dolce at Decorum Est of men gurgling from gases like devils that have been kicked out of hell, you know. You know, like, wow, that's great. I, you know, I want to go on with my life. Um, it's more a sense just as this horror of, yeah. of that event. 
And same thing with Beers, same thing with Poe, same thing with Melville, uh, same thing with many, many authors. None of them, none of them saw that kind of horror and said, I'm not going to pass that on to others. I'm not going to use that as my artistic thing. Um, the, and even in the 20th century, when you look at some of the intellectual, like Sartre, for instance, or Eugene mm -hmm. Masco or Sam Beckett, they're all sort of festering that wound, you know, gnawing on that, 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 that sore. The only one who doesn't do that is this guy, Tolkien, as far as I can tell. Yeah, no, I think it's right. Even, even other, yeah, there's just a sense of meaninglessness, even in the non, you know, sort existentialist kind of camp. There's a sense of pointlessness to a lot of things, or, or at best things, you know, a lot of, a lot of great stories of the 20th century kind of end in this blase, there's no returning, we've got our memories, you know, ordinary life. But Tolkien does something very, very different. I think it's, part of it, part of it too, is that there was an increasing sense that not just something was wrong, but something as societally had gone off the rails and was right. becoming worse and worse and worse. You know, the, the technological horror, the, yeah. this, the right. scientism. This um, panopticon that's watching. Yeah, the pan yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a great story by, by Hawthorne, which is the birthmark, where the, uh, the doctor tries to get the uh, birthmark off of his beautiful wife's face and he, he mm. proceeds as he tries to get it and he finally kills her. Right. And it's, that's almost the sense I think Hawthorne had that, that this, um, this movement towards greater scientific study and uh, technological study was leading to our disastrous ruin. It is destroyed the world. And, yeah, and, and this is where, you know, Sartre's philosophy you know, is 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 capsule. You know, I mean, you, you kept it in that in that um, really symbolic title of no exit, right? There's no there's no way out. Really, is what that what the properly translated is. There's no way out. But Tolkien seems to write something that says actually there is. You know, we can see over the walls. There is a way out. We need. We're not condemned to this darkness. And of course, that's a theme that we see over and over again in Lord of the Rings. For anybody who's Absolutely. even remotely familiar with it, um, Absolutely. why? What, you know, what is Tolkien's response to this charge of escapism? Well, yeah. You know, yeah. is it bad? Are I we just denying the, the darkness of reality? Or well, what? He, I think he's spot on. And, and you know, he, he got criticized, especially with The Hobbit and then The Lord of the Rings as well. He got criticized by a lot of people because he wasn't tough enough. He wasn't writing like John Steinbeck, you know. He wasn't writing yeah, right. um, like Faulkner or like, um, uh, who's the other... Uh, Ernest Hemingway, you know, he wasn't this realistic, tough, facing the realities of the world. You know, he wasn't doing that. And I agree, he wasn't. He wasn't doing that. But uh, they accused him of escapism uh, to flee uh, this world. And I think that some people compared him originally to some of the Pulp Fiction writers like Edgar Burroughs or, um, right. you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs or... Um, Who's the other great uh, writer um, of the Robert E. Howard? You know Robert E. Howard, or um, mm. uh, later Mickey Spillane. You know they compared him to those guys, which no, he took his heads above them in many respects. But they too were kind of escaping. You know John Carter goes to Mars, for instance, or mm -hmm. we follow the yeah. exploits of Conan in an ancient barbaric age. Those guys were trying to escape to a certain degree. And many others were trying to escape to a certain degree, these pulp writers. But well, maybe in the way that, that taking opiates is a way of escaping in reality. Well, yeah. I and mean, that in a way. Of, that's yeah. a charge that's laid against them. Yeah. Yeah. And, he, and his response, Tolkien's response, was really quite powerful. Because I think he put his finger right on the problem. Let me, let me hear, um, here's the quotation. This is from his essay on fairy stories, uh, where he writes in response, direct response to this criticism. He says, why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics and jailers and prison walls? The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. In using escape in this way, the critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, 
They are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. Uh, I, I, yeah, it's marvelous because the, cri the criticism, as is pointed out in that article that I just uh, highlighted, the yeah. criticism is that escapism doesn't face the hard facts of the world. It's an opiate, as you said. You read Conan and you're like, okay, that's nice beach reading. And uh, then you have to go back to the hard work of being at a job. But Tolkien says, right, you got to like get back. That. Yeah. So his work is not like deserting the fight, or the gritty reality that we live in day in, day out. He's more like pointing away his literature, at least his aim, the goal, we'll see if he's successful, is to point to a world outside of the trenches yep. where we're in. This is actually, things are starting to grow outside the trenches. There's, there's, there's a green world, perhaps even, yeah, there's a green world out there that we can go into. So yeah, then I, if yeah. I, I was gonna say just, um, it occurs to me too, like the, if the charge is that, look, the world is a messy place. There's, it's, it's complicated, there's crap all over. You just got to deal with it. We got to, you know, we got to face it. Writing anything else, this happy-go-lucky hobbit skipping in the forest is just, it's, it's, it's escapism, right? You're, you're just, you're a deserter. You're, you're a deserter from the grittiness of reality. You're trying to you know, drug people with some fantasy. Um, but, but what it seems like then Tolkien's literature is, what he's doing in the Legendarium, and I would say some of his other works as well, is that, for him, the idea of escape of escapism is not what they really mean as deserting. He said escapism. This is the escape of the prisoner, which is in some ways to so bear bear with me here the the idea about there being like crap all over. This the world's a messy place, right? You got to get into the mess, embrace the mess. Is that what Tolkien's view is in some ways? Is to criticize is is that essentially criticizing Tolkien's literature as escapist, by which you know I mean deserter is a bit like criticizing me for reading the assembly guide and instruction manual for a new appliance, instead of just accepting the meaningless chaos of the scattered parts wrapped in plastic. Like that's the world, man. Like you've opened the box and the pieces are everywhere. And that's what we just gotta, you gotta deal with it. You gotta live with that. You know, I mean, that's essentially well, kind of the, the yeah. whole world view of reality. It's just bits wrapped in plastic, yeah. right? Like, in fact, that's all we're talking about. We've got oceans that are filled with plastic and there's just bits everywhere. Uh, and soon there's going to be bits of us everywhere. Yes. But if you read the instruction right. book and the assembly guide, it shows you how actually to fit the parts together to give a picture and maybe even a map of how to make it whole. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Tolkien right. was, he, he suggested that part of the, the uh, task of fantasy, of mythology, of art, is cleanse the, the worldview, cleanse the, the yeah. so you can see better. It's like what William Blake, that old pagan, used to say back in the turn of the 19th century. He used to talk about how uh, when, the, um, when the doors of perception are cleansed, then everything will be seen as it really is, which is infinite. In other words, the, the vision is that really what we see in, in front of us only is disparate, is only so much, um, what does Eliot say, uh, these fragments I have short against my ruins, it's only so much fragmentary material when you don't see the, how did you put it, the uh, the manual, right? Right. When you don't how to fit it together plan, as a whole. How to fit it together, which... Yeah. Um, which is, I contend, is the Logos. It's the lost vision of the Logos, really. But when you don't see that Logos, call it what you will, beauty, uh, nature, whatever, then yes, everything is going to be fragmentary. It's going to be pieces. And human beings can't live like that. And so what happens is when we lose that vision of the Logos, we go searching for something that will give meaning to our life, be it protesting on campus, be it joining the communist cause, be it uh, uh, taking our, our, our job very seriously or getting into politics. We look for something that's going to give meaning to the world. Or far worse vices. Far they worse vices. Themselves in, right? <laughs> to try and escape the, the, the anxiety, yeah. the meaninglessness, right? But all Drugs, those, violence, sex, porn. It's, exactly. Yeah. But all those are opiates. They're all right. opiates. They, they do not actually do what we need in our, in our hearts or, or souls or minds. Which is put the stinking wash machine together. 
yeah, <laughs> then you right. can use it. Right. Yeah. And I think I think that phrase, I, I really think that phrase that he uses, the uh, the prisoner's necessity of the prisoner to escape, is is crucial because you first have to recognize that you are a prisoner and that there is a home to get to. Yes. And no. that that ties very that strikes a very personal chord with me. Mm. Um the uh, I just want to repeat the, the the bit of that that passage that you read there. Uh, Tolkien said in in that quote from one of the fairy stories. He said, "Or if when he cannot do so, the prisoner when he cannot do so, when he cannot, um, oh, what is it? When he cannot do so, when he tries to get out, when he cannot try and get out and get home, he thinks and talks about other topics, topics other than jailers and prison walls. The world outside has not become less real because simply because the prisoner." cannot see it that reminds like you said that there is a home to get to right there's a home outside there um and it's not the world doesn't end at the at the razor wire of the prison walls that reminds me of my grandfather uh, who passed away this uh just uh this this last six months ago he was a he was a prisoner of war in world war ii uh he was captured at the battle of the bulge uh, somehow miraculously survived uh, the onslaught uh, was taken prisoner, uh, taken into far, far into inner Germany. And one of the things in his prison camp experience, one of the things that he held on to in that hell uh, was the importance of, among many other things, um, was the importance of little scraps of literature, a bit, you know, a few pages of the Bible, a few notes of, of some, some book or something that you could hide. These things could be read and imagined, right? You could see a world outside of the emaciated gray starvation that you're facing day in and day out. And he and this other guy, he, he remarks, he would always remind me the importance of this, said that that they would do the best they could every day. And so my grandfather would do the best he could every day to wash his face and to shave with a broken bit of metal and a piece of glass that they had found. You know, he said they probably cut a fine figure, you know, with these scruffy bits and patches and cuts all over. But, but that there was a great value in doing that. And why is that? Because the guys who didn't keep up some sense of the world outside, some sense of dignity of like, well, I'm going to shave. I'm still going to clean myself as, as best, you know, you know, making the best you can of a really bad, um, to, you know, circumstance to tools at your disposal. It's because guys who didn't do that, who didn't keep up some sense of the world outside, ended up eventually just wasting away into wraiths. And yep. dying or throwing themselves on the wires yep. i'm sure they mocked him him and this other guy you know with their motley you know pockmarred cut up faces but in the end he had enough hope this kind of activity cultivated enough hope in the end he did escape he escaped from the prison camp and made his way back across the battle lines and got home and married the pretty girl next door and i'm glad he did and that's not a piece of fiction that happened in real life because of a prisoner who's willing to hold on to something beyond the darkness that he sees around him day in day out, he actually can have a happy ending. Happy endings do occur in life, and that's a great yeah. story. It's a, it reminds me of Ernest Shackleton saving his men yeah. from, the, from the ice. But um, really, when it, it, again, it's you're right on that score. This this attempt to push the narrative that everything is fragmentary or everything is going to fall into ruin is you know, we see it in the, the the environmentalist movement or we see it in the overpopulation movement or we see it in the yeah. uh the, the political realm is the only realm that's going to save us movement you know all these different isms that show us that the world's fragmentary and you have to put your will subordinated to some greater person is going to dominate over you or else you're 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 going to die you know there's, there's meaninglessness if you don't bow down and vote for this guy or do this thing or recycle your bottles um right. and uh that's a prison that's it's a prison house to to think that way uh it is. and you can't get back to the princess and marry her if that's the case because there is no princess she's yeah. just a common drab you know, a jiglet, as as uh, Shakespeare calls him, which is opposite of gigolo. Um, right. You know, it, that's all she is. And and if if we see that as being it, then what's the point of of any of this stuff? 
Um, right. His his writings. I mean, I, I so many things just firing right now. One of the things that's firing is that great poem by Walt Whitman, where he talks about him hearing the um, uh, the learned astronomer. Okay, mm-hmm. and you've probably read this, right? But Walt Whitman, one of my favorite poems by by Whitman. Um, here it is. When I, when I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. I mean, that, 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 that's exactly it, is that, yeah. that that last turn, that's what Tolkien's literature does yes. to me, it seems, that we're in the muck of the trenches and only being concerned with the gurgling bodies like demons cast out of hell and the, the blood and guts that we're wading through, <laughs> is that Tolkien's literature then points us not only up to the stars, but says that there's, there's greenery, we, we're in a trench. You can crawl out of the trench. And I think there's maybe things starting to grow there that if we could begin to peep our heads up above the trench, we might see a bright green country under a swift sunrise. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is startling to me that um, William Blake was responding to a similar thing when he wrote that about the doors of perception being cleansed. Mm -hmm. And it's no accident that the band in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, named themselves The Doors. They were naming themselves huh, yeah. after the book that had been named based upon that, that poem. Because the same movement that occurred in the 60s, which many people looked down upon, the, the hippie movement, I guess, for lack of a better word, mm-hmm. was a reaction to a sense that we had become so entrenched, literally entrenched, that we were just waiting for the bomb to drop. You know, and mm-hmm. we're going to be incinerated, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're helpless. There's no way out, as you pointed with the with the, with the poem, no exit. But the artists of the time, for for all their faults, you know, Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix and uh, and the Doors and all these other bands, they were at least saying there is another way to live, an artistic way mm-hmm. to live. Now, you know, again, they they had their faults, and we can criticize them, but. That's what that movement was about. It was a response to that sense of being imprisoned. And that's mm-hmm. why, strikingly, that's why the works of Tolkien, I think, resonated so powerfully with that generation. So much yeah. so that he had hippies showing up on his doorstep to get a glimpse of the old philologist, you know, and he would open his door to be these hippies standing there waiting to shake his hand. And he was absolutely, because, you know, by this time he was a distinguished and a stodgy old Oxford dog, stodgy old right? Oxford guy. <laughs> you know, he had these hippies like, yeah, man, I love your stuff. You know, you've inspired me. <laughs> uh, and, and it's really, that's, I don't know, it's just moving to me because up to that point, there were all these artists, all these people were trying to say, just what's wrong? Something's wrong. It's terribly wrong. There's no way out. We don't know what to do. Along comes Tolkien. He's like, yeah, there's something wrong. This is what we do. We escape from the prison. Exactly. We look up at the stars. We fight against Morgoth. We uh, we struggle yeah. against Sauron. We um, we craft poetry and we build uh, havens, you know, here and there, because the mm-hmm. whole point is to create a home, to sing into yeah. existence a home that is worth yeah. fighting and dying for. That's exactly right. I think that's a great place to bring it to a close. <laughs>